Stroke and TIA. In this short video, we're going to look at stroke and transient ischemic attack, or TIA for short. We'll start with basic physiology, then move on to initial presentation, and finally, basic management. So what is a stroke or TIA? Simply, these are neurological symptoms caused by impairment of the blood supply to the brain. Both stroke and TIA can have the same symptoms and signs, but historically, the difference between them has been based off duration, with TIA resolving within 24 hours, but stroke persisting. As neuroimaging has advanced, it's now possible to see what has caused permanent damage to the brain and what hasn't. And so you could now classify stroke as permanent damage to the brain from this impaired blood supply, whereas TIA has, as its name suggests, a transient impairment, but doesn't leave any residual damage. TIA, by definition, is ischemic from impaired blood supply, whereas there are two subtypes of stroke, ischemic or hemorrhagic. Hemorrhagic stroke often presents very similarly to ischemic strokes, but when the brain is imaged, blood is seen. I'm not going to look any further at hemorrhagic stroke, but it's important to note that given the presenting symptoms can be so similar, early neuroimaging is essential to differentiate it from ischemia, as the management is very different. I think a very basic understanding of what different parts of the brain do is helpful in understanding stroke. Although there are far more complicated diagrams of this that are readily available online, here's a basic diagram I've had drawn for you. As you can see, there are four lobes to the brain, frontal, temporal, parietal and occipital. It's these parts of the brain that show the biggest difference between humans and other apes and are responsible for what's known as higher function. Below this, and where everything passes through before going onto the body, is the cerebellum and brainstem. Evolutionary, this is the oldest part of the brain and doesn't vary much between different animals. The cerebellum and brainstem, as you can see, are responsible for basic functions like coordination and balance. The frontal lobe covers movement and personality. Parietal lobe, language, understanding and processing, as well as sensation. Temporal lobe, speech, and occipital lobe, vision. A stroke can affect one area or a number, but the symptoms are related to what that part of the brain does. In most areas of the brain, the right side controls the left side of the body and vice versa. Each cerebral hemisphere or side of the brain has its own blood supply. Combining this information, we can clearly see that damage to the right frontal lobe may well cause left-sided weakness, as one of the things the frontal lobe does is control movement. Given each side has its own blood supply, it's very unusual for stroke to affect both sides of the body at the same time. And therefore, bilateral symptoms, such as both legs being weak, are generally not from the brain, and various other causes, such as spinal pathology, need consideration. So how do strokes and TIA present? The initial presentation of them is the same. As you can see from the cause of stroke, it's a sudden event and symptoms come on over seconds to minutes. Only rarely do symptoms progress over a longer time frame and that's normally because of more than one event occurring in short succession. The symptoms themselves then have to fit with originating from the brain as opposed to spine or peripheral nerves. Unfortunately, this is a hugely complicated clinical area and certainly not something to be expanded upon now. As a general rule, sudden onset of neurological symptoms of any type, especially if unilateral, is possibly stroke and it would be reasonable to manage it initially as if it was with rapid investigations and quite probably specialist review. If we look further at assessment methods for stroke, we find many options. I, and most stroke physicians, simply rely on good history and examination. But doing that well and getting the right diagnosis really does rely upon extensive specialist experience, and so isn't really something that I'd advocate for non-specialists to use in isolation. 
One of the simplest assessment ideas now widely used, especially in education of the public and in pre-hospital assessment is FAST. Facial droop, arm weakness, speech disturbance being the key three features, and then T for time. Management of stroke hugely depends upon time, so get specialist assessment quickly is the message. Unsurprisingly, a simple assessment like this both misses a lot of stroke, but also incorrectly identifies a lot of things that aren't stroke as being stroke. It has a positive predictive value of around 75%. So three quarters of people with one or more of the three symptoms actually has a stroke. But maybe more importantly for pre-hospital and ED use is that its negative predictive value is also around 75%. What this means is that of people that don't have any of these three symptoms, a quarter of them actually end up having had strokes. This is very, very important. A negative result really doesn't mean convincingly not stroke. Another similar tool to FAST assessment is the Rosier score, with Rosier standing for Rule Out Stroke in the Emergency Room. As you can see, it really only adds leg weakness and visual field deficit to FAST, but also starts adding criteria to make stroke less likely seizure or loss of consciousness. Unfortunately, its positive and negative predictive values are, probably unsurprisingly, not vastly better than FAST. The name, therefore, is really not very appropriate. It doesn't rule out stroke. It merely makes it less likely. Unfortunately, given the brain's complexity, there simply isn't a very good screening tool that misses very few patients. Hence my advice previously of sudden onset neurology needs serious consideration for stroke. There are far more complicated assessments than these that are so complicated they can't really be remembered. With the most common in use in the UK being the NIHSS scale. But again, these are by no means perfect. And indeed, in the case of NIHSS, wasn't purely designed as a screening tool. If you compare all these assessments to different parts of the brain, as we covered earlier, there's one area that's really not covered, the cerebellum and brainstem, which are responsible for coordination and balance. Damage here doesn't leave you weak, it just means you can't quite use something properly. Again, damage normally only affects one side of the body, so you may find the right arm just has difficulty moving properly, even though it isn't weak, or they can't walk in a straight line. Quite often people describe the problems by saying it's like they're drunk and I think that's a simple way to think of it. Speech slightly slurred, coordination slightly off, wandering off to the side. The other quite common symptom caused by damage to this part of the brain is vertigo, caused partly by impaired coordination of eye movements. There really isn't a simple way of differentiating causes of vertigo, and I think it's one of the most commonly missed stroke symptoms, so needs looking at separately. I haven't covered one key area of stroke diagnosis, that of stroke mimics, or conditions that look like stroke but aren't, or chameleons, conditions that are actually stroke but present like something else. I've left it uncovered for a few reasons. Firstly, it'll get complicated, and I think this video is already pretty advanced. But secondly, I'd prefer you to think something's a stroke and let a specialist decide it isn't, rather than missing it. It is, however, something well worth looking into if you're interested. As a final area, I'm going to look at management of stroke and TIA. This really breaks down into two areas, acute management and long-term management. Long-term management is mostly about rehabilitation and preventing the person having future events, which may well involve lots of investigations into the cause. We know that patients who have one stroke or TAA, regardless of size, are at a much higher risk of a second stroke. 
We also know we can reduce this risk quite effectively with medication and lifestyle changes. You can see, therefore, why minor strokes are important. They may not leave much or any long-term deficit, but a further stroke may well be worse, and we really want to stop that happening if we can. Acute management has two parts to it, really. Diagnosis and early treatment. Stroke and TAA is primarily a clinical diagnosis, and by that I mean it's a diagnosis made by an expert from taking the history and examining the patient. What's harder, and sometimes impossible to do clinically, is differentiating ischemia and haemorrhage. Brain CTs are done to differentiate between haemorrhage and ischemia. Importantly, not to diagnose stroke in itself. Indeed, most ischemic strokes don't show up on initial CT imaging, although a day or two down the line it may show up depending on size and location. MRI is far more useful in ischemic stroke, especially in cases where the diagnosis is in doubt, as it's far better at showing acute ischemia. In TIA, no or minimal abnormality is detected on brain imaging. If ischemic stroke is picked up very early, there's the option of thrombolysis therapy, the injection of a drug that actively breaks down the thrombus causing the stroke. There's also increasingly the option of thrombectomy an interventional radiological procedure where they go in and mechanically remove the thrombus. Both of these, however, only work if done early, hence the need for rapid transport, clinical diagnosis and imaging to exclude bleeding. Other than that, recovery from stroke is really about time. There's nothing we can give or do to help the brain heal quicker or better, and therapy really is to help the person cope with their problems rather than to speed improvement. The rest of acute treatment of stroke is all about preventing further events, which, unfortunately, are relatively common in both the acute and longer term period. Hopefully that's given you a basic introduction to stroke and the key messages of suspecting stroke in any sudden onset new neurology, and that time matters. <laughs>